This Tuesday is a big day in the life of our country, and it is fitting that we are in Daniel chapter 8 this morning. And in Daniel chapter 8, we see yet another vision of the prophet Daniel. And just like all the other visions in this book, uh, or like many of the others, it has to do with world leaders. When a world leader comes to power, how does it happen? And is it merely just the, the will of the people? They get to vote and put in whoever they want? Is a world leader put in place by might, right? Might, uh, right by might. Is it, is it the strongest and the smartest who takes control of the government? How do we end up with the leaders that we have, and why is it important to know that? This morning, some of those questions will be answered, but, but I want you to know right off the bat that Daniel chapter 8 is not about the fact that God is sovereign over world affairs. That's not the main idea. Instead, what we will see here, the point of this passage, is that God is sovereign over world affairs, therefore, be ready. God is sovereign over the world's affairs, therefore, we as the followers of God must be ready. So, so let's get right into it. We're in Daniel chapter 8, start reading in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. So let's stop here real quick. Daniel's giving us some context. This is the third year of the King Belshazzar, um, who was the last king of the Babylonian Empire before the Medo-Persians came and, and took over everything. But something else happens here that's kind of hard to see in our English Bibles unless you pay attention to the footnotes. Here in chapter 8, Daniel starts writing in Hebrew again. Remember chapter 1 of Daniel was in Hebrew, then chapters 2 through 7 he switches to Aramaic, which is kind of the universal language of the day, so indicating that the message was meant for everybody. Well, here in chapter 8 he switches back to Hebrew, which means his primary audience is the Jews who were in exile. And so you have the Jews taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar, by the Babylonians, and they're still in exile, and this is the third year of Belshazzar, so roughly... Uh, 550 B.C. And Daniel has this vision, and I love, did you see how many times it says, I saw, I saw, I saw. He, he has this vision where he sees himself in another place. And that place is Susa, which is the, the capital of the Persian Empire. So Daniel's in Babylon having this vision, but the vision takes him to Persia. Let's see what happens, verse 3. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one horn was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was none who could rescue him from his power. He did as he pleased and became great." So Daniel, in his vision, is taken to Susa in Persia, and he looks, and standing next to him is this ram. It's a weird-looking ram, right? It has two big horns, but one is bigger than the other. And suddenly, the ram leaves where it's standing, and it says he charges west and north and south, and nothing can stop it. Let's see. Let's keep going. Verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, a male goat came from across the, uh, came west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. He came to the ram with two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke two horns." And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. So, 
Daniel's looking at this ram that charges. It, it goes everywhere, and then suddenly this goat comes flying by, and he's running so fast he's not even touching the ground. And it says this goat has a weird horn between its eyes. So this is a unigotacorn. And it smashes into the ram and knocks him down. I mean, this, this goat is so powerful that nothing can stand against him. But then, this conspicuous horn is broken off and four horns grow in its place. Verse 9. Out of one of them, out of one of these little horns came, or of one of these four horns came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the hosts and some of the stars it threw to the ground and trampled on them. It became great even as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown, and and a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act, and it will prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over to the sanctuary, and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. So you have this goat with four horns, and out of one of the horns comes another horn. And that horn grows and grows and becomes massive. Then there's someone else in the vision named the prince of the host. And the burnt offering is taken away from this prince. And in the prince's sanctuary is overthrown by the goat. And in verse 12, it says that the goat throws truth to the ground and it prospers. And, and then Daniel hears someone talking and he says, how long is this going to go on? And, and someone else says, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, and then the sanctuary will be restored. So just like the vision we looked at last week in Daniel chapter 7, this has wild imagery. I mean, there's a lot going on here. But unlike what we saw last week, this week, Daniel gets an interpretation. Look at verse 18. Let's look at verse 15, rather. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. So Daniel gets this vision. He says, I need help understanding it. And the angel Gabriel shows up, and Daniel freaks out and falls down. And Gabriel tries to tell him, no, this is for the end. And then Daniel passes out. <laughs> now, I want to pause here with a reminder that Daniel is no uh, emotionally weak man. He's not given over to drama. I mean, this is a, a, a man who, as a teenager, stood up to the guards of Nebuchadnezzar, right? I mean, this is a man who confronted Nebuchadnezzar himself saying, don't be prideful, don't sin. I'm going to tell you some scary things, and you need to be able to hear it. In chapter 6, even though the events of chapter 6 happen after the events here of, of chapter 8, we see Daniel spend the night in the den of lions. I mean, he is no chicken. And yet, at the sight of an angel, he gets freaked out. Hearing him speak, he passes out. Cute little chubby angels are fun at Christmas time, but when you see one in the Bible, it is a frightening thing. Gabriel has to pick Daniel back up and says, no, 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 you, you need to listen to this. And he tells them the interpretation. Look at verse 19. He, this is Gabriel, he said, behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. 
And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when their transgressions have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many. And he shall even rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I arose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. That last verse is an encouragement to me. I mean, you have Daniel. One is known as the interpreter of dreams and visions. I mean, he helped Nebuchadnezzar understand what he dreamt. Later on, he helps Belshazzar understand the writing on the wall. I mean, if you were in Babylon at this time and you needed help understanding a vision, Daniel was your man. He was the one to call. But here, Daniel gets a vision and he doesn't get it. Then he has the angel Gabriel himself show up and say, let me tell you what it means. And he still doesn't understand it. And so if you read through this with the the ram and the goats and you're thinking, "I, I don't understand, you're in good company. But thankfully, we have something Daniel did not. We have the hindsight of history. So we today know a good deal more than Daniel did. But but let's look first at this interpretation. And as we look at the interpretation that Gabriel gave, we need to be careful not to combine it with what we saw last week in chapter 7. Both dreams, both visions, for instance, have these powerful little horns that rise up and start wreaking havoc. But just because they're similar images does not mean they're the same thing. And so we need to see chapter 7 and chapter 8 as distinct, two different visions. But here's what the angel says. That ram with two horns, one is higher than the other, that's the Medo-Persian Empire. It's going to come from Susa, the capital, the citadel, and take over everything. Now, remind you, this dream happens in the year 550 B.C. The Medo-Persians didn't come until 539 B.C. So, 11 years before it happened, Daniel is, is having this vision. Here's what's going to happen. Then you have this speedy eunuch go to corn, and, and Gabriel says, this is Greece. All right, we looked at this a little bit last week. Alexander the Great comes with astonishing speed and, and takes over um, kind of the, the northern Mediterranean Sea area and then goes east and conquers all of Persia. And that happened in 331 B.C. So again, 200 years before it happened, Daniel's saying this is what's going to happen. And so God, through Gabriel, through Daniel, is letting the Jews in exile know Here's what's coming next. Now, learning all of these things could be alarming. I mean, you have countries taking over other countries. You have kings uh, leading armies, their vast armies, and conquering other kings. You have some rising and some falling. But that's not the most distressing thing that Daniel sees. For that, we need to consider this little horn. And again, the little horn of chapter 8 is not the little horn of chapter 7. In chapter 7, remember the little horn was the kingdom of Rome, which, uh, which comes and, and, and takes over everything. And the little horn there points to the Antichrist who will eventually come and wreak havoc on the world. In chapter 8, this is not the same. Remember that after Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was split into four, and each one of his generals took over one of the different areas. And it's out of one of these that the little horn of chapter 8 comes. And this horn we see in verse 23, listen to this description. He's a king who's full of intelligence. 
and cunning and great power. And he causes destruction wherever he goes. And he attacks the sanctuary. And he takes away the burnt offerings. And he sets himself against someone that verse 11 calls the prince of the hosts. Later on called the prince of princes. And so this, the, the clues of this passage indicate that this prince is God himself, right? It's his offerings that are taken away. It's his sanctuary that's attacked. It's his people that are killed, and they're called the saints. And so when you see the prince here in chapter 8, that is God. So someone from the four kingdoms of Greece will rise up and make war on the people of God, take away the offerings of God, and overthrow the sanctuary. Nearly everybody agrees that this was fulfilled with King Antiochus IV, uh, who was from the Seleucid section of the Greek Empire. In the year 186 BC, he leads uh, an assault on Jerusalem, ransacks the temple, outlaws Judaism and, and its practices, including circumcision and um, sacrifices, and uh, he stood in the temple and started burning copies of the Scriptures. The following year, he goes inside of the temple, inside of the holiest of holy places, and erects an altar to Zeus and makes a sacrifice of a pig on the altar. Some scholars even say he sacrificed humans as well. Daniel 8.25 says that he was great in his own mind. And Antiochus called himself Epiphanes, which means God manifest or maybe um, God illustrious. And so Antiochus either saw himself to be God or at least God's representative on earth. But then we're told this isn't going to last. Verse 25, um, he, even though he thought himself sort of divine, he would be broken, but he would not be broken by a human hand. As a result of sacrificing the pig on the altar, the Jews, led by the Maccabees, lead a revolt, a rebellion against him, and in 165, they retake the temple and they purify it. And so this is, at least in part, what, what Jews celebrate um, at Hanukkah. Antiochus died in 163, some say of an illness, some say of grief, um, but we can see here in Daniel 8, it was God who took him out. Now, I love history. I, mean, I find all of this fascinating. Um, but Daniel has more than just a history lesson in mind. And we know that in part because of the way he reacts. Now, what he sees wouldn't take place for hundreds of years after he wrote it down. So he knows there's nothing immediate that's concerning him, and yet when he sees this vision, what happens? He was overcome and lay sick in bed for days. And eventually he gets back up and goes to work, but says he, he continued to be appalled by the vision. Something in what Daniel saw terrified him. And he was also compelled to write it down. And so I want to get at what that thing is. What was it that Daniel saw that appalled him? And then I want to kind of draw out two lessons for us to take home today. First, what did Daniel see that horrified him? It was this warning. Persecution is coming. We saw something similar in, in chapter 7. Remember, the Jews are in exile. They are being disciplined for their sin. Seventy years they will be kept out of the country of Israel. But then they were supposed to go back. At the end of that 70 years, everything was supposed to be made right. The kingdom was supposed to be glorious again. They would have their land back and have a king again. But now Daniel's finding out going back to Israel doesn't mean things are going to get better. But think about it. Daniel's writing this toward the end of the exile. But the events involving Greece, especially the part about Antiochus IV, that wouldn't happen for roughly 400 years. And so let's put that into perspective. 400 years ago today, the pilgrims were still three weeks out from landing at Plymouth. Right? So 400 years is a long time. Daniel's writing, but the events involving the temple and Antiochus, that wouldn't happen for 400 or so years. Daniel saw a vision of the future, and though it scared him, he wanted to write it down. No one in his generation would live to see those things come to pass. 
No one in the generation after would live to see those things come to pass. And, and no one in the generation after would live to see these things come to pass. But Daniel wrote it down so that, A, there would be a written record, but B, the parents would tell their kids, who would then tell their kids and then teach their kids, you need to be ready. There is horror coming. And really, though, though it wasn't directly addressed in Daniel chapter 8, the Jews needed to hear that message of be ready. I said that Daniel's vision took him to, to Susa, which is the capital of the Persian Empire. Well, just a few years after this, Persia would indeed conquer Babylon. And the events in the book of Esther take place in Susa, the capital of Persia. And so when you read Esther and you see the, the plot against the Jews to try to have them wiped out, that's a persecution that they would still face. A short while later, when Cyrus lets the people return to Jerusalem, we see in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that they do get to go back to the land, and they're trying to rebuild the temple, and they're trying to rebuild the walls around the temple, and they're constantly facing persecution, even though they're back in the promised land. And so Daniel is pointing out to them, look, yes, this is what's happening in the future, and you need to be warned, be ready for persecution. But even though persecution is coming, you can still trust God, because he's told you in advance that it's going to happen. And that takes us to the first point I want to get from this passage. God is in control. God is completely sovereign, meaning there, there is nothing outside of his control, and we can trust him. I mean, look back at verse 23 here at chapter 8. Here Daniel's talking about the winding down of the Greek empire, and here's what he says. At the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king shall arise. And so, yes, Alexander comes and conquers the Persians, and yes, after him, his empire is split into four. But all of those divisions and all of those times were set in place by God before. Yes, there were transgressors. Yes, there were evil men in charge and taking control, but they were still limited in their evil. God had set the parameters for their kingdom. Then when Antiochus shows up, we see in verse 24 that he has great power, but it's not his own power. He was empowered by God. And you may think, well, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. Why would God empower an evil man to do something evil? And because of that question, some people think, no, it was Satan who empowered Antiochus to do the things that, that he wanted him to do. Either way, it was God who directly gave him power or God who allowed Satan to give him power. Our response should be the same. When we see that Antiochus was empowered to do evil things, our mind needs to go back to the book of Genesis and see a man sitting in a jail cell. A man who was falsely uh, accused. First, he was kidnapped by his own brothers and sold into slavery. Then he was falsely accused of a crime he did not commit and was thrown into jail. And we, we see this, this man, Joseph, get released eventually and end up in a position of leadership in Egypt. And, and his brothers come to him and he sees him. And do you remember what he said to them? You meant this for evil, but what? God meant it for good. God designed Joseph's slavery. Slavery. God designed Joseph's imprisonment. Why? Is it because God is evil? Is it because God is mean? No, it was because God had a good plan to use Joseph to save all of Israel, but that salvation would come through the suffering of Joseph. And we see the same thing here with Antiochus. God put Antiochus over the Seleucid kingdom there in the Greek Empire. God allowed Antiochus to attack his own temple. But we also see in verse 25 that it did not free Antiochus from responsibility. He would be broken down for his sins. And so what we see here is that God is sovereign over the world leaders. God is sovereign over the kings and the kingdoms and the times and the reigns. I mean, just think about this passage. God brought the Medes and the Persians to take over Babylon. God brought the Greeks to take over with lightning speed 
to conquer the Persians. And not only do that, but if you remember from your history, what else did the Greeks do besides conquering the land? They also imposed imposed their culture and their language, radically changing the places that they took over. So that most of Eastern Europe and the Middle East had the Greek culture and the Greek language. And then what happened? God raised up the Romans to conquer the Greeks. And, to conquer the Greeks. And, and what did they do? They brought throughout Europe and the Middle East, going all the way to India, they brought civilization. They brought um, ingenious planning and administration and logistics. They set up roads. All so that at just the right time, God would send his own son into a land where everybody had a common language, everybody in the whole area spoke Greek, and that they could travel easier from town to town and country to country, easier than any time in history. And the Roman legal system was put in place so that God's son, though innocent of any crime, could be trialed and executed by the leaders so that he could be the perfect sacrifice crucified for the sins of the world. And when this son rose again on the third day, word of his resurrection and the forgiveness of sins that he offers for Jews and Gentiles would be able to spread quicker than, than, uh, than Alexander the Great spread throughout the, the empire. No, the message of the gospel spread quickly. God was sovereign over all of that. God uses governments and kings and kingdoms to further his purposes. God is sovereign over history, not just Jewish history, not just Christian history, world history. And while it's good and right to to look back and see the the interconnectedness of of how this impacted that and how this country did that and this, that's all good and right. And we can see that, yes, there are always a thousand things at play whenever one government seat changes to another. But behind it all is a sovereign God working out His good plan to perfection. So we need to learn this lesson as we approach this Tuesday. We get a vote, and our vote counts, but God has already planned who will win the election. President, Congress, government, uh, governor, councilman, school board, no race is outside the care or the plan of God. Therefore, we can go forward into this week knowing that whoever wins, it was God's will. Now, we don't know if it's God's will to bless or to discipline, but we can know that it's God's will. We probably won't know why until eternity, but we can know it was God's will. In which case, we must be humble and gentle, knowing that God is the one who puts the leaders in charge that that are there that should cause us to be humble, which means on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, whenever we find out the results, if your side wins, you won't be arrogant because you know God did it. Or if you wake up and your side loses, you're not going to be bitter because you know God did it. Or if your side wins, you're not going to be overly hopeful and expectant uh, that certain things are going to happen. Why? Because we are told not to put our, our trust in princes. And if your side loses, you're not going to get overly anxious and concerned. Why? Because we know that ultimately God is doing something good. And so what I'm driving at is we must, as the church of God and as the children of God, be a people who are ruled by peace. We should be able to sleep soundly on Tuesday night no matter who wins the election. If the Apostle Paul could sing in prison and persecution, and if Daniel the prophet could rest among lions, we surely should be able to rest peacefully after an election. Not because our side won, but because God is in control. And His peace comes not because everything goes our way, but because He is in control. Let me ask you to do something. Starting today, this week, I mean, these are good things to do always, but especially this week, meditate on two verses, two Bible verses. Maybe you memorize them. If you don't memorize them, maybe put them on a sticky note, put them on your computer or on your TV. Here's the verse. 
And this is especially helpful for the, if you're on the winning side on Tuesday. Psalm 146, verse 3. Psalm 146, verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, in whom, uh, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. Leaders can change rules and laws, but they can't save you. Only God can save us. Here's the second verse, and this one's always good, but especially if your team loses on Tuesday, Psalm 112, 7. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Man, you memorize that and you can face anything. The boss comes in and says, we need to talk. The doctor comes in and says, we have some concerns. Your kid comes up, wakes you up in the middle of the night to tell you something. What do we say? He's not afraid. I'm not afraid of bad news. Why? My heart is firm. I'm trusting in the Lord. I mean, we need to get these two truths deep inside of us and meditate on them and dwell on them. God is sovereign, and there is no salvation outside of Him. That's the first lesson we need to learn from this passage. Here's the second. Um, Daniel's vision was fulfilled, right? We, we saw that. It was filled by the Persians and the Greeks and in Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, and so, Daniel told the Jews in exile, get ready, this is coming, and then it came. It happened. But what we also see is that Antiochus was a type. In the Bible, a type is a, is a sort of foreshadowing. And so, for instance, in the Exodus, the Jews are told uh, about the Passover. You, you take this white, spotless lamb, and what do you do? You sacrifice the lamb, and, and its blood will be a covering for you so that you will not face the wrath of God. And we're told that that Passover lamb is a type. It's a foreshadowing of something greater that is coming. And then we get to the New Testament, and we see that Christ is the Passover lamb. He is the one who was sacrificed for our sins, and his blood was shed so that we would be covered and not have to face the wrath of God. Or think about the temple. Remember in the temple, there was a a huge curtain separating the the holiest of holies from the rest of the the temple. that, That curtain was a type, a foreshadow of something greater. Namely, Jesus, who is the one who grants us access into the holiest of holies, not in the temple, but in God's own presence. And so you have a type, and then you have what follows after it. But these types aren't always positive. What we see here is that Antiochus fulfilled the prophecy of Daniel 8, but he was also a type of something greater to come. And by greater, I don't mean better. It's a foreshadowing of things to come. And Jesus talks about it himself in Matthew chapter 24. And we're, we're really going to dive into this over the next coming weeks. But he says this. This is verse 24, 15. Jesus is talking and he says, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, then you know it's time to get out of Dodge because things are about to get really bad. And so Jesus points back to Daniel talking about the temple pro- being profaned. We already saw that that happened with Antiochus, and he says, that's going to happen again. And then you see that happen again in AD 70. The new temple that King Herod built was destroyed by the Romans, and Jesus says, yeah, that's not the end either. There's still something else that is coming. There will be another figure, one who, like Antiochus, will set himself up against God and against God's people. And he will be cunning, and he will be imposing, and he will have great power, and he will make war on the saints of God. But, just like Antiochus, we see that this figure is on a leash and in a timetable set by God. But we're told about it so that we will have the strength to endure, because things will get bad. Listen, things will get bad. And if your hope is in a government full of sinners, which is what all governments are because they're humans and all humans are sinners, if you put your hope in the government, you will be let down. And when the persecution does arise, and again, it's already happening all over the world, 
when the persecution does arise, if you set your hope in the government, you will be let down, you will be frustrated, and you will be bitter. Or, if you put your hope in security and in safety, I mean, we live in the woodlands, and we have lots of money, and we have nice houses, and British accents. <laughs> but we have these things, and we think we don't need to worry. I don't need to worry about the same things that people in Houston do. We, we have things better up here. And I don't care if the economy tanks, because I have a really nice portfolio. I have lots of money saved up. If the source of your hope is in the things that you have, you will be let down. And so I'm calling on you now to put all of your hope and all of your expectations on Jesus because he will never fail. He is doing something during this time. He, he is not absent. He is very active in the world. In corona, in crazy elections, in financial crashes, in anarchy, in war, in betrayal, in deceit, and in lies by those we trust. Listen, God is doing something through all of that. And here's what he's doing. God is exercising patience. Second Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. Jesus is coming back, right? We, we've been told that he is coming back. And we may be thinking, okay, now's a good time. And that's good to say, amen, come Lord Jesus. I am ready for Jesus to come back. But he's not back yet. And so Peter says, it, he's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 2, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God has laid out the whole timetable of what's going to come, and that includes hardship and persecution. Why? Why would God allow that? Because he has children during this time that need to hear the gospel and repent and believe. There are children of God who have not yet been saved, and they will be saved when we preach the gospel of God's forgiveness to them, when we love them with the love of Jesus and serve them with the good works in the name of Jesus. And when they see us endure pain and heartache and persecution, and when they see us lose loved ones and money and security, when they see that, when they see us lose elections, and through it all, we don't get bitter, and we don't get anxious, and we don't get rebellious, but instead we lean even harder on Christ, praising Him for His grace and His mercy in the midst of that hardship, God will use that. God will use us as His ambassadors in a hostile foreign land to save His children, bringing them reconciliation in Christ. And so we need to remember this, especially this week. This Tuesday is an amazing chance to show the world that we have a sovereign king whom we trust implicitly. And we have a chance to tell them that we have a hope that is greater than any election. Our hope is the one who forgives us of our sins. And so let me plead with you to trust him. No matter what happens, trust him. 